It, it was kind of funny because a couple years ago I heard that this was going on, and I, I happen to know one of the guys, I'll get into that in a minute, that has a C-47, and I've been involved in that. And the minute I heard that they were going to be staging out of Oxford, um, my, my air show operations group, um, some of the guys are here, we do uh, almost, well, next year it'll be 29 years we've been doing this all over the country, doing handling ground ops and shows and things like that. I said, there's no way that this can go on 20 miles from my house and us not be involved some way because I would shoot myself. <laughs> um, so uh, this is kind of how that came about. And I'm going to do the whole thing about uh, how it all got together, kind of an overview, and then when they left. I, I'm not talking about over in Europe at all. I got a little video at the end. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about what happened over there. Matt was part of that, so I'll, I'll let him talk about that. But um, if you want, you can bring the lights down if you want. It'll be better looking. And for those of you who are interested, that little card that's out there, uh, it's got all the stats. I'm not going to go through them all, but these are all the stats for the D-Day squadron on how much it cost and what, what, what went on during the whole time. Um, DAX over Normandy happened um, 2014. They were trying to get for the 70th anniversary a bunch of Dakotas. Uh, so for, this, for the 75th, they were also involved, but the U.S. wanted to get involved. And the Contingent, the U.S. contingent of that is the D-Day squadron. And it was big. It was really big. Um, for those of you who were following it, uh, it was everywhere on the Internet, and it was awesome to just follow along, especially when you know some of these people. Um, this is just some of the magazine covers. Um, fabulous event. It's, uh, it's one of the best we've ever been involved in, and it wasn't even an air show. Jeff. So how did it happen? Uh, Eric Zipkin... He's uh, the owner of Tradewind Aviations with his brother. Uh, they came across uh, in 2009, they were going to have an anniversary at Oshkosh in Wisconsin of the uh, DC-3 C-47. They wanted to get involved. They found this, this airplane. Oh, is that working? Got the wrong end here. Oh, no, tell me my pointer's not working now. Well, anyways, uh, this was sitting down in Georgia, needed engines, and they got it together and put it together. They put a Union Jack on the nose and called it the Union Jack DAC. Now, they didn't know its history at the time, but if you notice, I wish this would work, because it's not. Why that was working. Right here, there's a notch in the tail, and that shows that it towed gliders. Uh, most DC-3 C-40s didn't tow. They had a nice little sweep in there. This one doesn't. Uh, so they went to that there, and they slowly, throughout the next year or so, they found out its history. And this is Eric, and that's Placid Lassie. Placid Lassie towed gliders at 4 a.m. on D-Day uh, out of... Uh, so they, they found the right paint job, put it on. They found one gentleman who was still alive who flew on it. Um, he was a tech sergeant. He flew uh, as a flight engineer. And uh, they took him for a ride. So they formed a company, uh, an organization called the Tunison Foundation. His name was Tunison. And Eric decided in 2013 that he wanted to bring that airplane over to England for the 70th. So his, his air, this airplane and two others went over from America. They had an amazing time over there. And he started talking to people. He says, "Why we need to do this, but we need to get more for the 75th. So he's been working on this for quite a while. And I've known Eric way back then. So um, he's a friend of mine and whatnot. So, yeah. so this, is, this is developing. So when I found out that this was happening 20 miles from my house, I asked the guys, and they said, yes, usually we get, we get paid to do this. We get all expenses paid and everything. But being that this, this was a, um, a special event, we, we didn't do any of that. Uh, we, got, we got some meals. But... Um, these are the guys, and I said, i got to get involved. So I called Eric uh, about a year and a half before, and I said, you know, what, what can we do? And he says, I can't have my guys do this. He, he has a base there. They do a charter work with airplanes. Um, he can't take his guys off to park a bunch of C-47s. So I was involved in that. Next one. Over the year, we started doing a lot of things and planning things, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but if you notice, they're all pointed down. This is the final plan. Uh, one, one of the reasons it, it was like this, we had them originally parked all over here, all in different places, um, so that when it was time to go fly and practice formation, they could uh, easily go out without having to you know, get around anybody. And over time, Eric and I decided that that wasn't a good plan, because when they go over to England, they're not going to be all be able to be sequenced. So this, any, any one of these airplanes could lead the formation every day, and what, what these days in, uh, included was training. This was not an air show, although the public was let in. This was training for them. I'll go into that in a second. 
But so this is the way it was lay, lay, laid out, and this airplane could be the lead, or the one in the middle could be the lead for the formation. How do you work that out on an airport when you're taxing the runway? It's, you know, there's not a lot of places to turn. Jeff? So, new jobs. My load increased a lot starting in January. Um, I had to find volunteers now all of a sudden because they were going to open up for the public. It wasn't just my guys handling the airplanes. The other problem was I'm, I also in school. I uh, do special ed at Cheshire High School. I can't just take a week off during the year necessarily. So I could only get there at about 3 o'clock, but Jeff Clark and some of the other guys were there during the days. Um, so they took over. Uh, we loc I located sponsors. Next thing you know, I was coordinating reenactors, who uh, Matt was one of them. Um, I had to work with the marketing department on marketing this. Uh, parking spots, where does everybody park? It's not, it's not a, uh, you know, a venue where you can have a lot of car parking. Um, we designed signage and placements, the parking map, and uh, even, even the dinner centerpieces, believe it or not, I had to find. Believe it or not, we found them. It, just like that, it was unbelievable. Everybody wanted, everybody wanted to be a part of this. It was just amazing. Jeff? Okay, the planes that were involved, I don't necessarily have to go into them, but uh, this is Placid Lassie, the uh, flagship of the organization, and a D-Day veteran. Uh, Spirit of Venovia came from California, uh, a good friend of mine from out there. Uh, Liberty C-47 is a D-Day vet. Uh, Virginia Ann was a D-Day vet. Um, Miss Montana came from Montana. She was a smoke jumper, um, very famous, and it was on CBS um, Sunday morning. They had about a 15-minute piece on her restoration to get over to, to, for this event. They put their whole heart into it for a year and got it there. So it was pretty amazing. Jeff, next one. There we go. Miss Virginia, believe it or not, she's based in Virginia. Uh, that's All Brother, which um, led its whole division during D-Day. So it's a pretty famous one recently. D-Day Doll was also a D-Day veteran. Uh, Flay Bob Express was a, a, a corporate airplane for, um, not a corporate, um, the royal family and stuff over in Europe during World War II. Uh, Betsy's bomber that came in late in the war. Uh, Historic Flight Foundation. It's actually a C-50, uh, I mean, it's a DC-3, but they were still allowed to play with us, you know. Um, and go next slide. So that's a quick overview. Early arrivals. They were going to come in on Sunday the 12th of May and leave on the 19th, which was also a Sunday. So they're going to be there for a week. I got a call on Saturday. Uh, the 11th, were coming in early because Sunday was supposed to be raining. The rain was coming up the coast. They were down, a lot of them were down in Maryland. All of a sudden, I got to get a bunch of guys, and we got to recover a whole bunch of them. Uh, so this is twilight on uh, Saturday, May 12th. Uh, we all got there, and, and we collected four of them uh, just as it got dark. Uh, it was pretty exciting. The next day, solid rain. They didn't do, they didn't do anything but relax and uh, have dinner and lunch and whatever. Jeff? This was Monday. More rain. Uh, there's some of my guys sitting under the wing. Uh, I think, Dave, were you there? Yeah. I uh, was trying to stay dry. Uh, this is That's All Brother, and that's Virginia Ann. Next one. So the activities. What did they do every day? Uh, they always had a briefing in the morning for a formation flight. It's not an easy thing to move these airplanes around and to get them in position, and it was practice for them. This comes into play later. Uh, they'd have lunch. They'd do safety briefings, which included a lot of things I'll get into in a minute. Uh, they brief sometimes for a second formation. Not every day, but sometimes they would, and they go up and form eight. If you were around in the middle of May, you probably saw some flying around, because I was out at school, and a whole six of them came flying over my head, and I was like, just, I just didn't want to be at school, because <laughs> they're all the guys I know. Um, and then uh, public access opened from 9.30 to 5. And we had dribs and drabs during the week. As we got to Friday and Saturday, there was a lot of people, and it was pretty fun. Jeff? This was the route they were going to take. It's called the Blue Spruce Route. Uh, it's an old World War II, except for Oxford. That wasn't there in World War II. But this just shows you the, the hops they were going all the way over to, um, to England and then on to uh, France. They also did some stuff for uh, the 70th of uh, the Berlin Airlift, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, some went down to Italy for a show down there. Once, once the big D-Day thing is, some of them broke up. Um, they did candy drops and all kinds of stuff. But that, this is basically the route they took. Okay, volunteers, we couldn't have done it without him. Um, this gentleman in Morocco, he had this, uh, he's a military vehicle collector, collector, lives about a quarter mile from the airport, has a bunch of vehicles, is a pilot. He came over and says, what do you need? And uh, we used this little mule 
a Vietnam era to move, move people back and forth, ice, water, whatever, uh, was very handy. Um, this, uh, um, Mark Corvino was my uh, volunteer coordinator because I couldn't be there every day. Uh, Mark's from the Connecticut Air and Space Center. Um, and this is uh, Dave and Dave and Alan, I think, uh, uh, one of the days we were there. Remember, this is a week, this is a whole week, so we had to be, we had to man this whole thing for all, the whole week. So it was just, uh, it was a lot of fun. Next one. Press day, pre Wednesday was press day. They did a flight um, from Oxford up to uh, over Pratt & Whitney to, sa to salute the engine maker, although one had right engines, one of the C-47s had right engines. Um, this is uh, Dave Hamilton, which I'll get into later. He was a, a pathfinder. He's the last surviving pathfinder that went in before all the jumps to set up all the beacons and things. Um, so we had a lot of press there and did get a lot of press. It was on the Hartford Current, every, every paper you can think of. Jeff? We've got some reenactors. Uh, matter of fact, that's Matt right there. Um, the gentleman on the right, the, the far right there, um, that's Mark uh, Castiglione facing us. His dad was an early honorary member of the group here. He gave us a talk. He owned uh, Branford Hobbies. Now Mark does. Mark um, actually jumped um, wearing his, uh, he had his father's neckerchief, his ring. What else did he have, uh, Matt? Uh, we both had pieces of the original shoot. The original shoot? Uh, I had his original invasion. Okay. Yeah. And you'll get into that. But and he actually dropped and jumped out on the same drop zone his dad did in World War II. That's a, that's a pretty neat story. But I've known Mark even, you know, since I knew his dad when we started this whole event. Uh, next one. So preparation. A lot of maintenance. They, uh, nothing broke down on the trip. Okay, if you can believe that. We, uh, uh, there were 15 airplanes coming from the United States. We had 11 in, in, in uh, Oxford. Uh, they did take a lot of maintenance, but they were ready for it. Um, the pile of stuff here, there's, uh, they brought their own oil. There's uh, the red and yellow uh, bags. That's all safety gear. They're going over water in a 75-year-old airplane. Um, over cold water in May. So I'll show you what they did for that, but that's what all that safety stuff. And in one of those, a couple of those boxes are these. These nice little parachute -y things. And the Jelly Belly Company made these little parachutes to drop candy over in Germany. So, uh, and they did. They dropped thousands and thousands of them out the C-47s to celebrate after the D-Day, a couple days later. Jeff? This is uh, Lake Quasipog. And they all had to practice getting in and out of their immersion suits. They had 90 seconds to get in and out of them. Um, I've seen some video. It's pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, they got in. This is the middle of May. They got into the water. They, got, they inflated the life raft. They got in the life raft. They didn't want to have any issues when they were, if they had to go down over the ocean. So it was, it was pretty interesting. Next. Okay. Takeoff sequencing. This is what I talked about before. When you've got a formation set up, you've got a lead and whatnot, what's happening in this, is, in this image here is um, D-Day Dahl is not in the lead, and he's behind someone else, but they were all parked in a line. He's going off into the side. This one's going forward. I think another one went by, and then he had to come out and get in line again. And the reason they practiced this a lot uh, was because it wouldn't happen in Europe that way. Um, in the end, it turned out that the DAX over... Uh, uh, Normandy was not as organized as these guys. Um, and you'll see in a video I play at the end, there's a formation going over the Normandy beach. And you might have seen it on TV, a very tight formation of C-47s. That was all the U.S. guys except for one. Because the, the, the guys over in Europe just couldn't get their act fully together. Even though they had 25 airplanes in the end, they couldn't get their act together and get it tight for what the Air Force and the military and the you know, so, uh, Secret Service wanted for the president and all the security. Uh, so the ones you see are the ones that were here, which is I'm pretty proud of that, even though I had nothing to do with it. Uh, next one. This is some of the formation shots over Connecticut while they were shooting. Matter of fact, this one's right over Beacon Falls. You can see Route 8 down here going through the valley. This is going north just on their way back to Oxford. Uh, next one. And they were busy. Uh, this is That's All Brothers Crew. Uh, that's uh, Virginia Ann over New Haven. And you can see them all coming back. And this repeated every single day. And after Monday, every day was great. And it just, every day got even more beautiful. So it was really like an airfield. And it was pretty unique for, our, for everybody involved. Next one. Honored guest. 
Lieutenant Colonel Dave Lehan, last living Pathfinder pilot, he went in first. Um, they went out over the ocean, literally the Atlantic Ocean, and then came in uh, going due east and dropped all the Pathfinders who then set up all the beacons for everybody else to come in later. So they were in there before 12 o'clock, 12 p.m. Um, Peter Gautier, he flew 680 missions over the hump. And if he, he, I don't even want to fly over the hump once, but he did 680 of those. And so those were our two honored guests at uh, the dinner. And he ended up going over there, and he was a celebrity. You couldn't believe everybody interviewed him. So next one. We had a big send-off dinner on Friday night. Uh, we had, this is where our job gets tough. There's one, two, three, four airplanes that we had to cull out of the line and bring over, set it up. And then when everybody left, we were still there. You can see us over here, moving them back out to put them back in line so they could fly again tomorrow. Saturday the 18th, this was Friday the 17th. Saturday the 18th, uh, the, big th the big event was a flyover down the Hudson River and back. So we actually took the squadron down the Hudson River, turned it around over the various Center and came back. Uh, next one. And it was spectacular. It was a beautiful day. Uh, this is the spirit of Bonovia which actually was uh, Chiang Kai-shek's airplane at the end of the war and then became part of the uh, civil air transport for China uh, before it eventually made its way back to the U.S. Um, I'm actually in that with my wife. Uh, this was taken from Miss Virginia um, by a gentleman. And uh, next one. It was, uh, it was stunning going down there with all these airplanes. And that was a shot taken down in New York of us coming over down the Hudson. And then we turned around and went back. And it was uh, spectacular. It's, uh, you know... It's really amazing. Next one. And it was good practice for them. Tight airspace. It's, anybody ever flown down that route is a lot of coordination with the FAA um, and other things. Just friends. My wife and uh, Jeff Kaufman. Jeff's the pilot for that airplane. Um, it's owned by a winery out in California. Uh, we've known Jeff for about seven years out there. And um, all those years was the first time I was able to go flying with him because we're always too busy working the show. Great guy. Um, Mo was one of the uh, organizers of the D-Day squadron marketing, and that's just uh, one of the crew after we went down the Hudson. Go ahead. And I have to say, I, you know, some of us, my guy, we knew a lot of these guys before, and we knew about half the crews before, and we've worked with them at air shows, and, and they've flown other airplanes, so we've known them, and then we met the other half. So it be, quickly becomes a, a real family. It's, it's a pretty neat thing. Um, photo tour. Because the photo tour was uh, Saturday morning and Sunday morning, Guess who got to be there at 5 a.m. to open the gate for the photographers? Me. Um, I wasn't there all week except in, at the end of the day, so that was my duty. Uh, plus, I like to take pictures. But these guys all came in. They paid to be here, and that helped support the group. Um, the light was beautiful, and we had a, it, was, it was amazing. The photographers just had a ball. Next one. And these, these are the ones who were allowed to go out on the runway and do other things. They paid a lot of money to do that. Um, and they got some fantastic shots. Jeff? Mission begins. Okay, this is Sunday morning, the 19th. Uh, it got a little more emotional for me than I thought um, because uh, here they were training for a week, just like a mission. They're doing security, I mean, safety, everything, uh, pl all the planning, and next thing you know, they're going to leave, and they're not going home from an air show. They're just starting. Okay, so this was... I didn't get, get teary-eyed, but I got choked up because these guys are heading out and we're sending them off. And, you know, it, it's dangerous flying these things when, you know, you've got 75-year-old airplanes. So they had briefings in the morning. Uh, the photographers were out. The planes were ready. Father Ted Leonard, he was a friend of the Bonovia owner. Um, he, he ended up blessing all the airplanes. And Father Ted has an interesting history. We rode with him on the airplane down the Hudson. Father Ted is an Anglican, uh, um, Anglican Catholic priest. Uh, don't ex I don't even know how that explains, but that's what he said. He was in the Navy flying uh, C-2 CODs, which were the carrier onboard delivery planes, going out to the carriers and back in the early 70s. He got out of the Navy. He became a priest. He went back in the Navy in 89 and, and became a Navy chaplain uh, during Desert Storm. So it, it's, it's, he was a Navy pilot, and... Uh, it was just really interesting because you, you don't really see that when you see this, but he had a dual career in the Navy with the um, minister in the middle. Next one. Saying goodbye. Um, that's uh, John Sessions. He owns uh, the Pan Am one. Uh, some of my guys, Mo. Uh, actually, that picture of Mo, he's talking to Dave Rogers, who's back there. And Mo is Italian. He came from Italy, has an accent. 
and he's, he's telling Dave that he had a deep, deep uh, mistake when he had pineapple on his pizza the night before, um, and you cannot do that. Okay, so they were in deep conversation about pineapple on pizza at that point. Uh, next one. So it's start time. They're all geared up. Now, we, they didn't all go at once. Uh, I think they were spaced out over about two to three hours. When, it, when one was ready, they went. They weren't going over in formation. They didn't need to do that, so they didn't. The first one took off, uh, Miss Virginia took off uh, probably about 8 o'clock, and the other ones followed. They were all gone by about 11, 11.30. Uh, but you can see it was pretty exciting. It looked like an air base in, in Europe. It was unbelievable. Next one. That's Jeff heading out. Uh, this airplane was a little bit different. The Spirit of Anovia, it has speed mods on it. It's got tighter cowls and, la and uh, um, gear doors that cover the landing gear, which not like uh, most C-47s don't have that. He's got squared off wingtips and long range tanks. So that little hop, skip, and jump you saw on the map, he went right to Greenland. Uh, the, one of the problems is at Presque Isle and at Goose Bay, Labrador, they only had a 150 gallon uh, tank truck. So it was multiple, multiple runs to fill the planes up. Not 150 gallons, sorry, it was 700, but still, they take like uh, 13, 1400 gallons. So it was very slow, they just decided to go. And some of the airplanes had long range tanks on board that they put inside like big oil tanks inside the plane, and they would feed off of those, so they didn't have to stop as often either. And that's Miss Virginia's first one out. Go ahead. I think you took that shot, Jeff. Um, this is leaving. Uh, it was, they, they wouldn't let him go. It's unbelievable, the, the, the excitement that uh, happened. Placid Lassie was the last one to leave. Uh, Eric did not plan it that way. It's the way it happened. Uh, next one. And. You know, we were all wishing him Godspeed. We choked up a bit. Um, Jeff took this picture of uh, one of my guys and his son. His son was there the Saturday th uh, that they came early, and he got to see them leave, and that's just, uh, I just like to end on that shot because it's pretty neat. Um, before I go on to the next one, any questions? Yeah, John. On two subjects. One, did, you, did the planes have modern radio equipment? Good question. Two. Yes. Right. Were those radio beacons or light beacons? Light beacons. And, and, and radio, like, um, Matt, they were like, uh, uh, radio just you, like you do a radio direction finder, and you just home in on a, on a signal. So it wasn't, you know, we're over here, and it was, it was a series of things like that. And yes, they did have, most of them all had modern uh, electronics, GPS, uh, everything on board. Gary? Yeah. No, no, I, I, ju I, we were just Oxford. They had, they had coordinators for all of that, but what, what happened, and, and it worked out really well, was that we took a huge load off of the group. They could focus on what they had to do. I mean, when, when they left the airplane after a flight, they either went to lunch and then had a briefing, or had a briefing and they went to lunch, and they always debriefed anyways after each flight. So it, it took a huge load off, and Eric was so happy that, and he knew what I did before I talked to him, but uh, he was so happy to have us on board, so it was, it was really good. And, for us, it was probably for a week-long event, which we've never done. It's, it was probably one of the uh, best things we've ever done as far as, uh, you know, excitement, the thrill of it, the, 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 the adventure, everything about it. Even though we weren't going, we were living through them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so it was, it's pretty neat. Yes, John? Gary, what was the average or typical cabin temperature of those uh, it, it all varied. So, some were insulated. The DC-3s were really nice because they had, they had insulation and leather seats, and the other ones had troop seats and, like, no insulation. So it varied, but uh, they, they bundled up. So they were probably in the 40s most of the time, I would say, but, you know, and I didn't get any exact temperatures. But, uh, mm -hmm. And all these people, now, there, there was no foundation that spent all the money on this, okay? Everybody had to raise their own funds, and there was a few American DC-3s that had to drop out. The average ended up to be in about one hundred fifty dollars to $200,000 just to go. That's how much they spent. And it, there, it was no donation, no corporate underwriter. There was a lot of help with the gas, a lot of cheap gas prices. Some of the oil was donated. But still, the, the spare parts they brought, you couldn't believe it. They had tires. They had spare engines. They had all this stuff, and it had to be weighed because then you can't get on with three bags because you're going. They were away. Some of these guys didn't get back till the end of July. Okay, that, they were over there for a long time doing things. You just can't go over with all your bags and throw them on and over, all of a sudden the airplane's out of weight. 
So, you know, you got on board one of these at Oxford and you say, wow, look at all that stuff. Some of them took it out and stored it, but there were spare parts. You just, you cannot believe it. And some of the, um, if you're a pilot, you know about 100 hour uh, inspections and things like this, certain time frames has to be done. Some of them, and they went early, that's why they went on the 19th, because weather, mechanical, all kinds of stuff could mess it up for June 6th. So they went early. Some of them needed 100 hour checks and they stopped in Edinburgh at another C-47 that's being restored over there at his hangar and they spent three days doing the 100 hour inspection and getting that all done So because it was going to be up during the trip and they didn't want to do it in the middle. So as soon as they got to Scotland, boom, they pulled all the engine cowls and started pulling everything off. It was a huge coordination of this whole thing, let alone practicing with, with, with the jumpers too. But they all ended up meeting at Duxford Airport, which is the Imperial War Museum's uh, airport and uh, museum there, and that's kind of where they started basing out of. Um, Jeff, next one. I'm going to show you a little video. Props. Props are in high RPM. Throttles. Throttles are set for half. Mixtures. Mixtures are in idle cutoff. Trim. I've got it set bottom of the green arc. Yeah, full pressure. Full pressure 29 minutes. Four stars complete. We won the war because of our logistical abilities, and the DC-3 C-47 is a manifestation of that. They have a soul. These airplanes have a soul. They're all exactly the same, but each one has a little something different from the other. Kind of better feeling uh, as a group is this is our moment. This would have been my father's dream to do this. And he was a very accomplished pilot, and I thought of him a lot. Almost every day when we're at dinner, we look at each other and we say, "Can you believe we're here doing this?" I don't know. It might be a once in a lifetime deal. Yeah. Well, it's not gonna happen again. Once every 75 years, whether you need to or not. <laughs> <laughs> some big ocean crossings to do and that's that's kind of the scary part. Of course it's the same route as that Roosevelt authorized in World War II. A lot of people say this will probably be the last large group of these aircraft to do in a land crossing. Now they thought it was nuts for wanting to fly it across the North Atlantic and it's probably true. These aircraft are 80 years old so parts are going to break off of them. Got the planes just as squared away as we can. You see everybody working and tweaking and getting everything done as best they can but we're gonna get these planes there and honor the troops and uh, we'll do what it takes to get there. I was only 17 years old and uh, I went in and volunteered during the war. It was a great honor to serve our country. I probably flew maybe 20 or 30 trips in one of those. We're doing this to let you know we, we don't forget your service. Every time I get in this airplane, you know, there's some 21-year-old kid flying across the English Channel with 29 paratroopers back there, younger than him, getting their fanny shot off, towing a glider. It's just amazing. What these, what these young kids did back then. And, and I think about the 20 and 25 year olds that flew these airplanes across the Atlantic using the stars as navigation, um, not knowing what the weather is when they get to their destination, not knowing if they have enough fuel or even exactly where they are. So it, it, um, I was mindful of that on the crossing. I think it was an opportunity to really honor the greatest generation. Very few of them left. We, uh, 
we're probably going to lose the rest of them in the next 10 or 15 years. So. I'm a kid. <laughs> what I'd like to see and learn is that, that freedom takes sacrifice, and we should not forget the men and women that lost their lives for the freedoms we have. Okay, I'm going to give it to Matt. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matthew Jolwick. I want to thank the uh, roundtable for having me here tonight. Uh, I normally don't stand behind a podium, so if I seem a little awkward, I, I apologize. I like to walk around, uh, but I think we're getting recorded, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to stay behind the podium um, per order. Uh, my involvement. I'm, I'm, as Leslie said, thank you. I'm, I'm your judge of probate here. I'm kind of a mild-mannered guy. I kind of feel like Clark Kent. In a, in a room of supermen, whether you're a World War II vet uh, or all the way through present Gulf War, um, I just want to say thank you for your service and your sacrifice because at the end of the day, freedom is not free. And there are those of us that remember that and know that, and I just want to say thank you for that. Part of that thanks is what I do and how I got involved. I got involved with uh, Marcus Diglione, who Jerry had pointed out before. His dad, Frank, was 101st uh, Airborne, 501st PAR jumped into Normandy on June 6th. So in Mark's life, it was always a central focus and uh, kind of uh, a fascination with, uh, with history and, and all things uh, airborne and World War II related. Well, uh, crazy likes crazy, and uh, I kind of like uh, adapted quickly onto Mark and uh, became a military enthusiast with vehicles and weapons and equipment and uh, all facets of history uh, really kind of called to me. Getting involved about 15 years ago, uh, it was the focus on meeting the veterans, uh, the guys in the books, the, uh, the Easy Company, the Band of Brothers guys, uh, the Bill Garniers of the world, the Buck Comptons, uh, Don Malarkey's. All, before they really became unable to go out, uh, they would attend air shows, uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, Jerry's familiar with that one. You'd get to go to these events, much like these roundtables, and you'd get to talk to the real guys. And talking to uh, the guy next to you is definitely a lot different than reading the history book or anything they teach you in school, which... I lament, uh, and I'm sure, John, you do too, there's not a lot that they teach you in school anymore about it. So I like to uh, be like a sponge and, and, and hear those stories. And that's kind of where I developed my, my frame of reference is that, yes, I got involved with the reenacting group. I got involved with collecting the, the memorabilia and the, and the military stuff. But I, I, I fashion myself more of a storyteller because at the end of the day, all the stories that the vets have, World War II vets or you have, those stories are alive while you're here. And they're as boisterous as you are and if you're silent when you're gone that story ends and if it's not for someone to hear that story and to repeat that story which I feel we have a moral obligation to do the youth of the world and the generations after us will not know your story so I like in my responsibility to be able to tell your story as accurately and truthful as I can so that when you're gone the next generation knows exactly what you sacrificed. And, and I know that historically, a lot of folks don't want to tell their story. They, 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 they served with pride and silence, and they came back after the war, and, and they built this country. Um, it's time for those stories to be told before it really is too late. Uh, I had done a talk in Madison the other week, and at the end of the talk, a gentleman came up and he said, I want to thank you for your presentation. It was much like Jerry's and what I'm going to put on here. And, and he said, in, in four days, he's going to be 98 years old. I says, well, that's an accomplishment in and of itself. And he said, well, he said, I was stationed in England in 1944. He said, I was a C-47 pilot, and I towed gliders, and I dropped troops on D-Day, and I did everything you were going to talk about and everything I'm going to show you in a video. And he thanked me for putting on the story. Now, I'm, I'm ready in, in, in tears here, feeling very humbled that I'm trying to tell his story, and here he is in the room, 98 years old. The sad fact was there was about 85 people in that room. No one knew that that's what he did and what his background was. And this was after an hour presentation when he came up and they all came and they're all listening to him and they're looking at him and they're looking at me and we're talking, we're talking about the equipment and the gears and, and this stuff. I bring my dummy Rupert. Everything he's wearing is, is, is what I jump in, is, is what I had. So that's all stuff that's been out of the airplane on the drop in, in Normandy and throughout the country. Um, listening to us talk, it was, it was a common frame of reference for both of us to be able to communicate. But the rest of the people who had been in this group with him for years didn't even know. Now they're celebrating him and they had a special lunch in for him. But, it, but if it wasn't for coming out and talking at events like this, his story would have never been told. 
Um, so I, I feel an obligation to preserve as much as I can and try to be as truthful and as accurate as I can with your story. Um, I, I feel that I'm entrusted with it and I'm going to do my best to teach my kids and the rest of the youth that I can about what was done. My involvement started as a reenactor with Mark and doing the things like that and I says, well, about five years ago we met some guys and they said, you know, this is all fun and, and you do a great job and you got great stuff and equipment. And he says, how about doing it for real? And you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 45 now. I says, my, my taste long since passed. Um, 4F, by the way. But uh, I said, uh, you know, I, I tried to do the call and I, and I didn't do it. He says, well, he said, if you go out with us in Oklahoma, you can go to the World War II Airborne Demonstration Team and you can do it for real. And that's when reenacting ends. Because when you're in that door at 125 miles an hour, 1,500 feet off the ground, it's not fake anymore. So what this school does and what this organization does is they travel the world and they show how airborne operations occurred in World War II by actually doing it. We jump out of the C-47s. The video here that Jerry had of the pictures, uh, you saw uh, D-Day doll. I've been out of her a bunch of times. That was my lift actually in Normandy. That was my, uh, my dropship in Normandy. That's all brother. Um, that plane, uh, the commemorative Air Force actually raised about $6 million to restore that plane. It's like a brand new Mercedes. The paint is wet inside. It smells fantastic. That plane uh, had, I think, three combat jumps and uh, drops in the ETO. It took place, uh, took part in uh, uh, Normandy on D-Day. Um, I think it did uh, uh, Dragoon in southern France and it did Varsity in, in Germany at the end of the war. After that kind of fell off the radar. It was restored, as I said, for the $6 million. Last October was the first time that that plane had performed any airborne operations, and it took place in uh, Frederick, Oklahoma, at the home of the World War II Airborne Demonstration Team. And there was about 100 of us there, and uh, I was lucky enough to draw the uh, stick, uh, the, the lucky number to get on the first lift. So I was the eighth guy out of that plane since the war. They had uh, 12 guys go up on, uh, on a day that it had flight operations. So to go out of that plane, um, being one of the first guys since the end of the war, it, it was pretty memorable. Kind of, you kind of, you kind of stifle the fear at that point in time, and you say, "I'm in a historic moment." And that was a year ago. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a quick uh, video presentation as a montage. It kind of takes you through an expedited process of how I got involved, what I did, what it took to train and prep, and the organization that it that it, that it entails to perform something such as the 75th anniversary. My fellow Americans, in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization. The first time I pulled into this place and I walked through those big hangar doors. There was one of the team members that was showing me around. He walked me up the catwalk and I looked down into the hangar and it's surreal to see two C-47 aircraft with invasion stripes painted on. It's a beehive of activity getting ready for that coming jump school which was going to be mine. It was just like I was going into a World War II movie or just being immersed in the moment in time. With the World War II Airborne Demonstration Team, we're the only place in the world that has facilities like this available to us and aircraft like this that are available to us. Frederick Army Airfield was a B-26 bomber base during World War II, and so the hangar that we're in right now held World War II planes. It housed World War II airmen and pilots. It's really a full immersive experience coming and staying in these barracks and, and staying in this hangar and you really feel like you're experiencing history. You're not just reading about it, you're making it a part of your own history. So when I found out that there was an organization in the civilian world that not only preserved the memories and the lineage and the heritage of our, uh, our fellow brothers in arms from past that would allow me to step in their shoes for a day, I couldn't turn it down. One of the biggest appeals to uh, coming here to Frederick and attending the course here at the Parachute School is the fact that you get the most professional training you can when it comes to static line parachute operations outside of the U.S. military. And I think the reason that everybody comes back here is they, they see how professional we are and the quality of training they get and how safe we are. But then after they've experienced all that, they also get to experience the camaraderie. We welcome you into the team and we just become a giant family that continues to grow. The jumping itself I've realized over the years is a small slice in a large pot. 
it's not just the jumping, it's the, the being around the equipment for some guys that's just out of this world. For some guys, it's the relationships you build down here. I figured I'd come down here, get my five and, and leave, but it just, it hooked me. The guys I met down here, the kinds of things that you can do via this organization, the trips to Europe, the interacting with, with the crowds at, at air shows, it's just something you can't get anywhere else. What guys do down here, they will take home with them, and it will resonate throughout the rest of their eyes. All men are equal before the open door of an aircraft at 1,500 feet. I don't give a damn who you are, or how much money you make, or what your educational background is. You got an open door, pal. And you got to step out right along with the rest of us. I came home with the same thing we send everybody home with, a sense of accomplishment, confidence, something that's going to resonate throughout your life. Your life is now on a different trajectory. To set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and cruel. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. For the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces, but we shall return again and again. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom as we rise to each new day and again when each day is spent. Let words of prayer be on our lips. motto is remember, honor, serve. They're, they look great on a logo, on a t-shirt, but when it comes down to it, that's what we're all about. Remembering their sacrifice and honoring the sacrifice of those who served and carrying on a tradition that should not be lost. We're the World War II Airborne Demonstration Team. Uh, our job is to remember, honor, and serve all of our airborne veterans. We are jumping out of World War II aircraft using World War II uniforms and equipment as period correct shoots as we possibly can so we're able to actually demonstrate what that actually was like to function as a paratrooper in World War II. I enlisted on my 18th birthday in April 9th, 1942. And uh, they, went to, they signed me to the 101st Airborne. I was in F Company 502. I was looking for a big adventure, you know, and I was looking forward to it. Well, I was lucky enough to grow up with, uh, you know, my own hero, my father. My dad uh, was a depression baby. War broke out, so he uh, requested to join this newly formed elite unit, the Airborne. It really helps put things in perspective whenever you're standing in this door and whenever you look over and you're seeing all these pictures and signatures of guys that were doing this exact same thing and thinking, that's why I'm here. They were right here in this exact same spot 75 years ago, and they were putting it all out there. They were offering up extreme sacrifices to get to where we are today. It just remembers that these, these average guys were, they were just trying to get home in one piece. My dad, it was a World War I vet. He got shot up so bad he was in the hospital a year after the war ended. And he always taught me, he said, uh, freedom is not free. People lost their lives fighting for it. By doing what we do, we pay tribute, not just to the airborne generation, but to the entire generation. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be approaching a fateful hour all night long, bulletins have been pouring in from Berlin, 
claiming that D-Day is here, claiming that the invasion of Western Europe has begun. Uh, let me read you several of the latest bulletins. One says that a report, unconfirmed by allied sources, of course, says that heavy fighting is taking place between the Germans and invasion forces on the Normandy Peninsula, about 31 miles southwest of La Havre. Another bulletin, also from Berlin Radio and unconfirmed, says the British-American landing operations against the western coast of Europe, from the sea and from the air, are stretching over the entire area between Cherbourg and La Havre. You know, what we have today, we owe to them. And I think to be able to, to embrace them and bring them out of the shadows and give them their due, it's important. There's streams of tracers and anti-aircraft fire coming up. And instead of slowing up, let us jump. He speeded up a little bit and started dodging these things. He turned a green light on. And he rolled the plane sideways and threw me off balance and I went out the door head first. I looked up and there was a ground, and I looked down and there was a chute. And I'd never been to France before, but it didn't look right to me, see. Next year marks the 75th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy Operation Overlord. Our team will be going over there specifically in support of the airborne operations that are going to be ongoing to commemorate the event. What makes this trip unique is we can really promulgate our mission of Remember, Honor, Serve by going over there and remembering what these guys did 75 years before us. The reason it's so important to us to be there is this is the last big event that they're going to have over there. This is the last time that we're going to see any number of vets around and healthy and able enough to attend the event. So we want to make it as, uh, as big and memorable as possible for them. Essentially, this is our last opportunity to help the world thank our vets for what they did for us. And being there for the 75th anniversary, and they're going to be there for potentially the last time, it's really going to be a celebration that's unmatched by any other. Give us faith. Give us faith in thee. Faith in our sons. Faith in each other. Faith in our united crusade. That will spell a sure peace. A peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men. And a peace that will let all men live in freedom reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done, almighty God. for the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. 
We have spent two years trying to get ready for this operation. It's been a very long haul. Our team has 70 personnel who have come over to do our mission, which is to remember, honor, and serve the World War II veterans. Our mission extends beyond that to teach the history of the airborne to the world. What the journey kind of has done is it's taken me from being able to tell that story of history to becoming a part of it. And as Jerry indicated, there was so much involved with going to Normandy. From the, from the airplane perspective, you had the extra engines and the equipment and all the stuff to get over there. Well, if you got a hundred guys in my unit going from Oklahoma, now mind you, there was tens of uh, thousands of people over there, and there were probably a couple thousand uh, jumpers from different teams across the world. The 82nd came in from Italy. The active guys, they jumped out of the modern planes. We jumped out of the old planes. Coordinating all of that uh, in modern day in the 21st century with cell phones and the Internet really gave me an appreciation for how they accomplished that 75 years ago because it was chaotic. Um, I'm kind of a type A personality and I, and I like everything regimented and I like to know A and plan A and plan B and plan C. Well over there every plan went out the window. As Jerry indicated it was very well organized here. Uh, in the video there you saw a lot of pictures of the planes. Nothing in that video was fake. There was no CGI. There was no Hollywood. Every time you saw a plane flying 75 feet next to the other one with the guys jumping out, I was there. You kind of suspend belief and you say, I think I'm in a movie. Because you look out the window and you see guys jumping out of the plane and the guy's screaming at you and you get up and you jump out of the plane and you're saying, you, you turn around, the chute opens and then three planes fly over you. The formation training here in the United States was amazing. Um, in talking to the pilots out there, they said, here's the interesting thing. And these guys are all accomplished pilots, are professional airline pilots. Uh, there was a, I think, was it, was it, is it, that's all brother, the, the pilot is F-17, F-1, yeah, F-117 pilot from the Gulf War. These, these guys know how to fly. But what they were saying to me was, None of them have been trained to fly combat formations in 75-year-old aircraft over Europe. And there's no books, and there's nobody left to teach them. So in the United States, they had to write the manuals and the procedures for all of that. So when we first started the formation training and the formation jumps, the planes were a lot farther apart. By the end, they were about 75 feet off each other's wingtip. So you could wink to the guy next to you as you were going out. 
and trying to get everybody out of the plane at a four or five birds at a time and not have anybody get hurt because it, here's the thing, Uncle Sam has an acceptable rate of loss, right? As Jerry indicated, everything is privately funded. There's zero acceptable loss here. Everybody needs to go home at the end of the day. So that's mission one is everybody has to go home. So safety is paramount.